Okay, well, after um, listening to these excellent presentations, <laughs> these excellent presentations, um, I um, was asked to be a respondent, to give a response or a discussion to Justin Lin's um, presentation, which I enjoyed very much. Of course, uh, it's very dif difficult to disagree with anything <laughs> you said. Um, so, um, my um, comments really is more about like elaborating on some points. Um, um, I, I particularly liked, of course, your talk about the role of the state, uh, something that is currently being reconsidered again after for many years, the role of the state was dismissed, but then we noticed that uh, by putting the state out of the picture for a while, really we did not get many results that um, we expected. So we had uh, rather dismal results with privatization in many countries and, and, and just relying on the private sector, which did not really uh, take on the task in many countries. Um, I also liked the the framework where you listed the steps, the six steps, and so and and of course I agree with that. But I just uh, would like some elabor elaboration about a few of them. So I'm going to go over them over the ones that I think um, might need a little bit more um, clarification. With the understanding that of course you had only 15 minutes. If you had an hour, maybe we could have gotten a lot more. Step two was about taking care of the constraints that face existing firms. Um, in many countries, and, and, and looking back as a, as, a, as a teenager in Morocco, um, with firms and the way the, you know, they were behaving and everything, the constraints that are put for the new firms to join in some industries were actually put because the special interests coming from the firms that exist wanted those constraints in place. Um, so how would we deal with, with those things? And I'm sure that in other African countries, we, we have similar situations. Um, then in step three, which was about seeking FDI from countries that have competing industries, but the, those industries might be dying now or losing um, comparative advantage. Um, that makes a lot of sense when theoretically we debate it, but really how many um, examples do we see? We see now some movement from China setting up some of the, the you know, either in Asia or starting in Africa, some of the business is, industries there, but it's not very, you don't find it in many places. And also what's really more important is that if you look at the experience of Africa with FDI, I mean, how much does Africa get as a share of world FDI? Very minuscule, what is it, two or three percent, which is really nothing compared to any region in the world. So how would, we, would you, you know, change this picture? And step five was on the special economic zones. Special economic zones are one of those things that also, if you study them theor theoretically, they are beautiful, they work and everything. But then if you look at the experience, I can pick two countries. Mauritius in the 70s did them and was extremely successful with them. Madagascar tried to implement the same model pretty much and it was a disaster. Madagascar did not really succeed a lot with its, you don't look at the development story of Madagascar and compare it to Mauritius. Two different trajectories. So, so again, they work in some places, they don't work in other places. Also in some countries, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Ghana is one of those places where the special economic zone might not be limited to a geographical area. So you can actually say that you are working in special economic zone without even being in that geographical area. So all those nice things that you want to have from the infrastructure being geared towards that geographical area will not really trickle down because you know you are defined by sector, not by the location um, or by activity, but not location. Uh, and then step six, where um, you um, advocate some compensating for pioneer firms or the first mover. Uh, which makes a lot of sense again. However, some of the incentives, and for example, tax incentives, we all know that in many African countries, they have a problem with even mobilizing taxation. So the tax base is small. So if you're on the top of it, you're going to tell the firms that you know they exist and they're in the formal sector where you could get the tax from that you are getting the incentives. It's going to really, you are diminishing the revenues that could be gotten for sure from those firms. And I, I don't think it will work in many countries, although Morocco tried them and I'm sure others tried them and they were quite successful there, but that's it, that's very limited number of countries. Um, um, and, and same can be said about the exchange rate facilitation in countries where they might have really already problems with international reserves. Um, and I also, I was, before you got to the point on agriculture, that was going to be my big comments, but then you got, you nailed that one and that's good. So. Um, 
agriculture, I completely agree with you. It's a crucial thing for industrialization in Africa. Anybody who wants to do manufacturing or industry, 10 minutes? I can see from here. Oh, OK, five. Thank you. So anybody who uh, wants to do thinking about industrialization in Africa by just going to, I don't know, like smokestacks and things like that, without thinking agriculture, they don't really know the continent. Most countries still rely on agriculture, big time. Uh, productivity is low, we know that. So really starting industrialization has to start by agriculture in many countries in Africa. And, uh, and for that, a lot is needed. And not specifically just the big machines, uh, maybe adapting some type of mechanization for the countries, you know, using new types of seeds and all these things. Uh, and I, so, so that's, I completely agree with you. Agribusiness should be one huge business in Africa, and it is not, unfortunately. Some countries have been more successful. Again, Morocco, and I'm really I'm more familiar with the story of Morocco and Ghana. But um, Morocco was quite successful in agribusiness. Um, and linking it to, and linking, and the other thing is this, we think even for agribusiness, we tend to think, oh, these are big commercial farms. That's not what's happening in Africa. Most uh, people who work in agriculture are really small farmers. So how do we find the solutions that are tailored to these specific things where you don't have the big, large farms or even the middle, uh, middle level farmers we don't have? And somebody has to work hard to create that. We don't have those. Um, we have small, illiterate farmers and also something, something you didn't, and again, I'm pretty much sure it's just a time constraint. Uh, what is the role of gender equity? In, in, in leading or you know, making transformation, structural transformation in Africa um, uh, successful, because in some countries, the majority of small farmers are women. Not all, but small, some countries, they have this situation. Um, I was gonna, I had the regional integration as part of this, and, and Celestine talked about that, role of regional integration. When you are thinking these huge, powerful uh, infrastructural programs, for one country, it might not be feasible. For a bunch of countries where infrastructure links the countries and the markets, it might make sense. So, so that's also an important thing. And the role of the global economy. Um, uh, Celestine talked about global value chains, and I talked about them uh, early on in the morning, and that's really very important. I am within the time. I have one more minute, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to one of the points I love today about Deepak Nayar's uh, presentation. And that's the fact that we have to learn to and learn from development. Um, People talk about, oh, this country made mistakes in this country. Somebody has to, maybe the two of you could come up with this book, where really we are just doing the unlearning part. Because once we unpack all those things that have led to the disastrous outcomes in some African countries, that's already a huge step in the road of transformation in Africa. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, yeah. I would like to thank the, uh, the two speakers. Uh, those were very interesting and uh, nice uh, presentations. Um, Professor Lin, I'm uh, a huge fan of your work. I'm following a lot on what you're writing on structural fund transformation. And um, the book, the two books that are coming out, um, I cannot wait for both of them to be on my shelf, really. And uh, I'll be making an order. Um, I want to respond to Professor uh, Lee's points, and I think I'll just stick to two of them. Uh, Mina has done great work on most of them. I don't want to, uh, to repeat that. First of all, I want to, to say that the last extra point that you made, Professor Lee, you took them as extras at the end the issue of the, ta the task of poverty reduction in Africa, I believe that should be foremost. It should be <laughs> the primary thing, really, because what you bring up is that what you say is that you, you place government or the state squarely uh, in the forefront of uh, spearheading this. So the state's role in the end is, is very important, especially when it comes to <coughs> infrastructure um, development. No doubt about it. We cannot... Uh, question the fact that Africa is badly in need of uh, infrastructure development. And uh, the, the, the example that we had of power outages is very, very key. 
And I think I want to go back to the other, to the point that you make, that in infrastructure development as well as in, in technology, uh, science and technology, Africa should not reinvent the wheel. If anything, we can leap forward. What are we doing? Are we learning from countries that, for instance, have wind power? Are we able to learn to get that technology and use it? Why are we having so much power outages that are even becoming a constraint to the foreign direct investment that we want to attract? So that's quite, that's quite key. Um, when we place this issue squarely uh, on the state's table, we're going to see that if states are decisive in what they want to do and they know what needs to be achieved, it will allow a high growth rate to be achieved. And um, in your writing, Professor, you have mentioned that China has done it. We can borrow technology. And that's quite important so that we leap, we leap forward. Um, the second point I think that needs to be emphasized uh, is in regards to uh, what must be done to, to, to leap forward. And I think um, um, what's important, you do make it in your writing, uh, skill development. That's quite important. If that's done, it's going to help us develop and build a key resource that we have in Africa. And these are the youths. The illiteracy rates are pretty high. We have curriculum that do not match what industry needs. So that, is, that needs to be taken care of. We need to build skills, no doubt about it, and um, allow the youth to be part of the growth process that we want to achieve in China. With that, I want to say thank you so much for the two wonderful presentations. Thank you. Yeah, this is really great, absolutely wonderful. Uh, it might be best for the presenters to come forward, right? Now you can sit on the hot stools, have fun with them. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are going. I'm going to entertain a number of questions. You already. I've seen some hands up already. That shows the level of interest. Okay, we will take a few questions um, and then they will respond. You go to the next set of questions. And I think I'm gonna start right from the front here. And then maybe I should do one, two, three. Oh, um, is, is, is it a double hander or a single hander? Okay, because, because what I was going to do was to, to finish this part here and then I'll come to that one. So, I hope, I hope your rate of time preference isn't too high. Uh, Professor Lemon, <laughs> okay, all right, okay, yes, please. Thank one, you very much, two, my name is. Three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, in that order. But please, make it very quick, right, and very precise. Thank you very much, I'll try. I, my name is Les Mola, I'm with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with the NIDA. Uh, I was very interested, uh, Justin, in your presentation about the structural economics and about the role of the state. But I want to ask you about the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the private sector in view of the fact that there's a lot of hype right now about uh, public-private partnerships, especially in infrastructure. Um, can you comment on that? I know we discussed it outside, so I just want to follow up on that comment. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Johanna Mauler from the University of Helsinki. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentations. And my question relates to the actually social or gender impacts of foreign direct investment. I've been following um, Ethiopian developments since 98 in different capacities, working at Africa Development Bank, and I was a researcher. And I mean, it's hugely impressive what's going on there. I mean, it's the third most attractive um, country for FDI now in Africa. But uh, the gender aspects that <laughs> none of you gentlemen took up, but fortunately Professor Mina did take up, are highly relevant because when you see foreign direct investments in the countryside, 
all these uh, big infrastructure projects, etc. It's really the women, it's who are the small farmers who, or even landless, you know, peasants who lose out in that. And the second relates to the textile industry. You see already that uh, companies, multinational companies from Bangladesh are relocating to Ethiopia, like H&M. What is it going to mean to the local entrepreneurs who are very often women in the textile sector. I mean, I've been do doing research on the successful Ethiopian female entrepreneurs, and they complain about it. You know, they are those who might lose out with this development. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Alan Rowe, from, uh, retired from the University of Warwick and also from the World Bank. Um, I'd like to pick up a couple of the phrases from both Justin and uh, Celestine. Um, find a niche, follow your comparative advantage, join um, international value chains. No one's going to object to those. But I'm very interested in how you see um, natural resources in the form of oil and gas and minerals in this context. I, I'll be talking at the session this afternoon on this myself. But it is a fact that the, uh, if you look at the success in foreign FDI in Africa in the last 15, 20 years, it has been extremely successful in attracting huge amounts of uh, foreign direct investment in those two areas. If you look at mineral dependence or oil and gas dependence, there are now far more countries where that dependence on minerals and or oil and gas is greater than 25%. So these sectors are becoming more important in Africa. Uh, and yet we still live with the legacy of the Sachs Warner resource curse um, theory. Do, do the speakers uh, entertain, as I do, some hope that the the finding of the niche, the entering of the international value chains can be achieved with appropriate policies, facilitating policies uh, on the back of these natural resources, which I think in Justin's presentation you tended to sort of group with agriculture and say that dependence has to be lessened over time. It's not being lessened if you include these uh, particular underground resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Kote from University of Ghana. Um, and I'm also privileged to be one of the authors to these two volumes. Um, I think leadership and the quality of governance is very critical in, in all of this structural transformation. Um, otherwise, you could have all the infrastructure development and all the policies that you need, but with poor leadership and, and governance structures we will not achieve. And that is the problem with Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. One, one last one from this uh, role. Thank you, Tatu. Um, my name is Vasco Nyabindi and from Mozambique, Edward Mondrian University. Um, I, I'm very much a thank for the two presenters uh, for this uh, um, on uh, structural transformation. And this slide is still there, and the question is whether the African countries are at the political level are prepared to think again back on the uh, on what is said in that slide, because most of the issues that we, we, we have have been raised and most of the time is that politically people want the integration, but the conditions are not there. The real condition that was raised by uh, uh, the so-called preconditions. People list the preconditions, but the real conditions are not there. So are we prepared really for regional integration being done under the real conditions that African countries have? That's my program. Thank you very much. The presenters will indeed respond. But please, uh, you don't need to be too, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, too complete in your responses. So we can go to the next set of uh, questions. <laughs> By the way, the discussion might you want to jump in. OK. So um, I'd like to respond to the first comments from the floor about the role of the state and the private sectors and regarding the infrastructure. And I think before the 1980s, the consensus in the world was the government should be responsible for infrastructure. Then coming to the neoliberalism, the idea changed that if infrastructure is some kind of economic activities, then we should leave to the private sectors. But as we discussed outside the door, you know, if you look into the evidence, you know, under this kind of new ideas, except one area private sectors is interested, that is 
telecommunication, mobile phone. And you did see a lot of private sector investment in those areas. And the reason why private sector is interested in the telecommunication, because first, it's easy to collect the fees. Secondly, there's some kind of monopoly there. So there's a monopoly rent. But other than that, we did not see any private sectors entering into the infrastructure. And as I mentioned to you, the infrastructure first is a long-term investment. Secondly, the infrastructure provide externality to private sectors. And it's very hard for the private sector to collect those kind of externalities in their fee, except you give the private sector some kind of monopoly. But monopoly is not good. And the third thing is that the return to the infrastructure very much depends on the intensity of the use. But the intensity of the use of infrastructure depends on the overall development in the countries. Individual private investor has no control of the overall invest, uh, growth in the country. So under the kind of situation, in the past 30 years, we saw there's no infrastructure investment in Latin America, in South Asia, in Africa. As a result, infrastructure became mining constraint for the country's growth. So I think that the state should play a leading role in providing of infrastructure. But whether the PPP will work or not. And if you look into the, the incentive structure of the private sectors, if you have some kind of public and private sectors in a partnership, very often, that will open the door for the rent seekings. So I think it's better for the government to provide the infrastructure and to be pragmatic, targeting the mining constraint first and uh, to generate dynamic growth in the country. And when you have a dynamic growth, the government will have more resources to improve the infrastructure to other parts of the country. And actually that related to the last question, the regional integration in Africa. Certainly it's a desirable you know, goal for Africa. However, you need to consider your resources. If you want to make the market economy in Africa integrated, how many infrastructure investment it would be necessary? So under that kind of situation, it would be you know, following what Celeste Munger said, to, guard, to target international market first. And if you want to reach international market, certainly you need to have infrastructure, but one industrial park will be sufficient. And I think the industrial park to your port will be necessary. And uh, with that, that investment, you can immediately reach 21% of the global market in the US, 23 of the global market in Europe, and 15% of the global market in China. And so if you look into the return to your infrastructure investment by this kind of pragmatic way, it will be generating much higher return immediately. And with this much higher return, the government will you know, earn more resources in the future to improve the other part of the infrastructure. And then you may be eventually to have a regional integration in Africa and that achieve in China, that achieve in the US, that achieve in all the successful country. No country start ways, you know, connected all the national market together and uh, with that to develop the country. They all started with something which can generate a high return, quick return first. Then I come into the FDI in Ethiopia and Africa. Certainly in the past, FDI mostly are going to the resources sector for forensic in purpose and so on. But I think that if the government has some kind of you know, enabling you know, policy to attract the FDI to tap into the other comparative advantage, that is the young, abundant labor force in Africa, then you are going to attract more foreign direct investment in those areas. And Ethiopia is a good you know, example. Before 2012, no foreign direct investment to make manufacturing investment in Ethiopia and for export before the Huajin success story. And after the Huajin success story, on the one hand, the government of Ethiopia has learned how to create an enabling environment to attract the investment in light manufacturing for export. And also the international investor you know, understood 
Ethiopia can be the manufacturing floor for the global market. International buyer, as you mentioned, H&M also can. And now Ethiopia has become the most attractive places for foreign direct investment in export-oriented light manufacturing, not only in Africa, but in the whole world. And then coming to the foreign direct investment in the light manufacturing, further like supporting the local entrepreneurship, I say yes. If you want to go into the international markets, certainly you need to go into the sector which you have comparable advantages, so you have a low factor cost of production. But at the same time, you also need to gain the trust of international buyers, that you will be able to deliver the good with consistent quality and uh, deliver the good timely. But local firms, they did not know how to do that. An international buyer did not have the confidence. And that is the reason why before 2012, no international chain set up their procurement office in Addis Ababa. But after the success of Huangqin, now you have more light manufacturing firms entering into Ethiopia. I'm sure very quickly, local entrepreneur will learn from those foreign direct investment and again the ability to produce good in consistent quality and deliver good timely. And that is also the evidence. Before 1980s, you did not have any you know, garment factory in Bangladesh export to the global market. At the beginning, it started with a foreign direct investment from Daewoo, from Korea. And now almost 95% of the export-oriented garment factory in, 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 in Bangladesh are owned by the local people. And I'd like to say, now they have 3 million jobs in garment sectors in Bangladesh. And it was also a story in Mauritius. Before 1970s, there was no export of garment and textile from Mauritius to the world, and they set up a special economic zone to attract foreign direct investment from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And at the beginning, almost all the firms were either owned by Taiwanese or by Hong Kongese. Now, more than 70% are owned by the local entrepreneur because they learn quickly. Then coming to the question, some of the firm, some of the export passage zone were industrial park successful and others were not successful. You compare the Mauritius and also Madagascar. I think one reason why Mauritius was successful because in the 1970s, its per capita income was about half of the per capita income in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, and that consistent with the principle I have. And uh, other country, their special economic zone in the park did not work because they are too ambitious. You know, like Madagascar, I did not check, but I'm sure Madagascar per capita income was less than one fifth of the you know, uh, uh, of the country where they want to attract the industry. And so they are not ready to that because those sectors are not their comparative advantage yet. And if they are not comparative advantages, firm come into the country for rent seeking instead of for utilize its comparative advantage as an export porting base. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celeste. Still have time? <laughs> Yeah, because there's uh, this side of the room too. Well, no, perhaps quickly on one or two questions. Uh, um, I think uh, Justin addressed most of the question asked. There was uh, just a comment on the gender. Um, it's kind of uh, interesting to hear that from a woman entrepreneur in, in Ethiopia because two thirds of the jobs which are being created in Ethiopia today are occupied by young women. Yeah. To me, that's the, the headline. In Ethiopia, two thirds of the new jobs are young women. So whatever uh, this uh, woman entrepreneur uh, uh, that you talk to uh, may be upset about uh, with Bangladeshi uh, firms coming in, uh, she should uh, know that uh, they are creating jobs for, for Ethiopian women. In fact, she should try to connect uh, to, to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, at least in the first term, there's always some losses here and there. That's the nature of the dynamics of uh, economics. But uh, 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 very quickly, uh, the, the, the country benefits. And that's, that's why I can tell you, if Ethiopia keeps doing what they are doing today, the next 
in the next 20 years, we'll be having conferences like this around the world on the Ethiopian miracle. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> so I'm not too worried about that because I really think that uh, they are recruiting young women. And I've seen them. I have pictures on my cell phone when I go to Ethiopia. I visit all the new industries. Most, two thirds of workers are young women. No, please, no, no, no let, 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 we can catch up after, 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 after during lunch. On natural resources, uh, yes, I used to be myself uh, 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 very uh, uh, skeptical of uh, the focus on, on mining uh, for several reasons. The biggest one being that minings usually do not create a lot of jobs. It brings a lot of money. It's good for foreign exchange for the balance of payment. Um, it generates rents, which are sometimes difficult to manage. But my biggest problem was that they did not mining uh, mineral, natural resources, or at least mining, in general do, doesn't create a lot of jobs. And that's a problem with African countries where you have. That's the number one problem. Now, if you're from a Gulf country, Kuwait, Qatar. Abu Dhabi, and so on, they have a very small population. So they, even there, they use the money from oil to diversify the economy. You go to Dubai now, and you see that they've been thinking very long term. They are trying to redefine these economies into something else. Well, the problem is, I think somebody mentioned the social, social aspect of this. The problem when you, when you have a large economy is that you cannot finance the social safety net with rents from oil. If you're Dubai or Saudi Arabia, you can basically, you know, exaggerating, you can put people at home and then fund a social safety net for everybody. Yesterday I was watching BBC and they were giving numbers on education, uh, uh, statistics in Dubai. Very unhappy about it, the Dubai government. And saying that they are very bad. Well, they can afford that. They can even pay people to stay home. But if you're Nigeria, you have 170 or 200 million people, you will never have enough revenues from, from oil, from mining, to do that kind of social safety net policy. You need to put people to work. So you need to use the revenues and rents from mining to really generate this kind of labor intensive strategies, which you may have the luxury of not doing if you are Qatar. But in Nigeria or Tanzania or Mozambique, you really need to use the rents, but you need to put people to work. Otherwise, you're gonna, you don't want to have millions and millions of angry people out there. Um, yeah, maybe let me stop here so that you, you can take... Uh, Thank you side. very much. Um, <laughs> right. I have to be complete. They don't have... I have to be... So, to be fair, yeah, we, we have to come to this side right now. Exactly, that's right. So, uh, Lemasempe, yeah, that's right. Um, one, two, three, four. <clears throat> and then one in the back to make five. Okay. The rest of the discussion can be so, bilateral. So, you can hear me, is that right? So, Augustine, uh, when you give uh, the presenters a chance, make sure that they don't present their stuff again, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, I'm from uh, the African Economic Research uh, Consortium, and um, I've heard Justin's presentation actually twice. Uh, the first time was in, in Abidjan, and I really appreciate that. What, what's in, what is interesting is that uh, you have an economist who has actually come up with a plan of action, right? <laughs> so, it's pretty refreshing, and I... Uh, but also I wanted to uh, caution uh, our African brothers and sisters uh, that uh, we should always be uh, aware that one side does not fit all and, and that we should actually be uh, careful. But then, and then Justin should be really part of a toolkit that we should be considering. But, but I have a, a couple of observations. Um, I, I hope that uh, Justin, um, uh, maybe in your, in your next presentation, um, because it, it comes across as if um, infrastructure is kind of unitary, you know, like physical, you know, power, electricity, you know. I, I, we, we always kind of underappreciate the value of soft infrastructure, you know. 
capacity. You know, I come from a capacity building institution, the skills, uh, governance. You know, somebody talked about governance. And then I think in terms of uh, quality of governance, um, I have an issue with your response to the private sector, you know, PPP. And, and one of the angles that you used was rent seeking. Rent seeking occurs in the government sector. You know, governments are run by individuals. And in fact, if you have this industrial policy that you mentioned, industrial policy policy makers could be captured. So, so it's really, you cannot simply uh, take away the private sector. In fact, I think there is really kind of um, uh, like overdue um, kind of underappreciation of the role of markets and private sector in, in what we're doing. Um, the second is, you know, who is going to finance, you know, transformation and industrialization? You know, there was a huge uh, United Nations uh, meeting last time in Addis, FFD. And uh, one thing that came up was the whole idea of domestic resource mo mobilization and self-reliance and also having a well-functioning uh, financial system. I think, that, I think that part should actually come into play. And here, I take an issue with my friend, you know. I know you have taken a very provocative, this notion of regional integration, <laughs> you know. I, in finance, I see the need for regional integration in Africa. And, and we have a, a large number of uh, stock exchanges now, is that right? Very balkanized, very thin, but having them integrated will all only, uh, will also help us not only the domestic resource mobilization, it's also helping us integrate globally. So uh, I, I really need, I, I think we need to resist the temptation of making a very kind of gigantic uh, statements. I, I, thank, thank you. So, uh, thank you very uh, much, Salema. One more, right. one more thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I felt like you went too far when you mentioned that uh, if you have missing industries, you should go to FDI. I think you should, you should you know, basically if you're you know, searching around for comparative lines somehow, you don't, I think you, you need to be, you should also ask the following question. Why is it missing? You know, it may well be that there are substantial barriers, one of which was access to finance. So I think one of the things I, should, I would do is to see if I can actually cultivate that gap before I jump into FDI. So anyway. Thank, uh, th th yeah. thank you very much, Lema. I think we need to organize another conference to uh, discuss these issues all over again. Yeah. I'll take one from here, from the middle, and one from the back. That's it. Okay? In fairness to everyone, this, it is not possible. It's not feasible for us to be able to answer <laughs> okay. all these questions. And so one thank in you. the middle. One in the middle. You, yes. You already selected me before. So uh, yes, so the lady, uh, one, lady, yes, <laughs> I, yes, lady, please go thank, ahead. And then one in the you. back does it. I'm sorry. Um, so one, a comment and a request uh, to Justin. I had the opportunity to visit the CNH garments factory uh, in Rwanda, and it is a pioneer factory. And it would be good to emphasize or highlight some of the soft infrastructure aspects, um, not just training and the fact that you have to spend money for up to a year to get the capacity uh, on board, but also things like minimum wage, that you start off from a low, low wage base, and if you want to incentivize your workers, then you need to, and if you rise above the minimum wage, then it becomes, a, it's taxed to the government. So there may be some adjustments that go beyond um, the pioneer industries, and there's some trade-offs there that are worth highlighting based on your experience. Um, my main question is with respect to regional integration. Uh, one thing is that while intra-Africa trade is low, about 46% of that is manufacturing. So do we have um, an endowment uh, advantage or comparative advantage in that respect, meaning that trading of manufactured goods could be a way to boost the industrial base? Um, and then with respect to, again, Rwanda as a case in point, Rwanda is a landlocked country, so even to access international markets, it depends on cooperation with its neighbors. So how do you reconcile this don't bet on regional integration when you depend on your neighbors to be able to access the international markets physically? Thank you very much. The last question from the back. Hello. Yes, thank you. I think there were very good uh, uh, presentations. My name is Akba Nepo from YFM. Those are two or three specific oh, I'm questions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are you, from, are you at the back there? You said one in the middle. Just one second. You, please be very brief. And then please. after that, Professor Jai. We can't come this I far from our you. countries All right, okay. and you start giving us one minute. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, bother coming. This is a very important meeting. Uh, you, you did compare Yere and uh, Ofebuane. I think we should be careful because we can, at times we confuse modernization with development. Okay. 
He oh. had his own purpose, he had his own challenges, but the two are not really the same. One's a subset of the other. My question, again, you, your framework, you mentioned Ethiopia here, and others have argued that Ethiopia is operating under a developmental state framework. How does that fit into your new socialist uh, economics uh, uh, framework? We've talked about the role of the state. In the early Chinese development up to now, China has a communist party, okay? And for years, you are restrictive. You don't open up, okay? Then you open up, the world became, in quote, amazed. In Africa, it is a little bit different, okay? With this so-called democracy where debates and debates could create problems. I'm not saying it's not useful, could create problems. So how, how do you reconcile that? Because now we're asked to uh, liberalize, open up, you know. And the Africans, in, again, we have to be very careful. Africa is large, as we've said, but 55 countries with different ways of doing things. Okay? So the point I'm making is that you talk about FDI coming to Africa. In Nigeria, the stories we have done show that the FDI is mainly portfolio investment, speculative investment, and it's not taking us anywhere. So, the, so, 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 so we need more of country specific studies uh, in our continent and perhaps see whether there are a few countries that could drive the process and others could, uh, could uh, 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 emulate. Then in your presentation, I've not read the book, the international financial architecture, the IMF, the World Bank, the rest, okay? How, I know there, are, there were committees to, to, to work on a new uh, architecture. How does that affect African development? Going forward. Thank, Final thank question. Develop, development is a struggle, as you all know. It's a struggle. So the type of state that is necessary to understand that is very important. And my view is that the so-called democratic states in Africa would that support development the way you are thinking. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, absolutely, in a very precise way, right? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Ibi Ajayi from University of Ibadan. Uh, to please to Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be very brief. I have so many questions. These are two excellent scholars, and they have made very beautiful presentations. So definitely they've raised a lot of questions, but I will ask only two. The first one is uh, during Lin uh, uh, Justin's uh, presentation on growth identification and facilitation, he says, avoid government doing wrong things or being captured by investor groups for rent seeking. Is that not the problem of governments all around the world? And in particular in Africa, always doing the wrong things, always being captured by the big shots, you know, the, the money bags and so on. Isn't that the problem? And how do we address that? Secondly, um, I want to go to uh, uh, Dr. Munga. Uh, of course, in the past when you were at the World Bank, you were sending so many design materials to me. Now I know why you stopped. You moved to a different institution. <laughs> But let me ask you a question. From what you've said in the book presentation, when you look at the general economic theory, I'm trying to ask you, should we really de develop a different economic theory for Africa? And if so, why? And why should we, and what area? Thank you very much. I have other questions, but I will stop there, Mr. Chairman. Thank well, you Well, thank much. you very much. I know, OK. Um, I assume there are no more questions. There shouldn't be any more questions. Uh, and as far, as far as presenters are concerned, uh, could you pro respond with each one for two minutes? Each one has two minutes, so please concentrate. And after, after the, um, the session, please come forward and uh, have additional discussions with them. Please. Well, uh, Justin the, and then. The first one, I'd like to respond to the issue of no one size fits all. I certainly agree with that. No one size fits all, right? But we know if we want to achieve sustainable and uh, inclusive growth, we need to create jobs. And if we want to create jobs in a sustainable way, then the jobs should be in the sectors which are competitive domestically and internationally without protection and subsidies from the government. And how can you have the sectors which can make you creating jobs and are competitive domestically and internationally 
then you need to follow the competitive advantages. I don't know whether that is one size fits all or not, but I know if you want to have competitive job in a sustainable way, the sector needs to be consistent with your competitive advantages. So you can say that's one size fits all, but I do not see any alternative than that. That's one thing. Secondly, I agree, certainly any kind of policy interventions require capacities. But if you want to have import substitution, you need to have capacity. If you want to improve the governance following the Washington consensus reform, you also need to have capacity. If you want to improve education for all the citizens in the country, you also need to have capacity. If you want to achieve gender equalities, you also need to have capacities. So it's not unique for any policy recommendation. And I'd like to say the policy recommendation from what I advocate is a new structural economics in a pragmatic way. Actually, the capacity requirement will be much limited compared to everything I mentioned import substitution, governance, education for all, gender equality for all. And actually, from what I see, all my interactions with the government in Africa or in other parts of the world, if the sectors that they try to facilitate is consistent with your comparative advantages and in a pragmatic way, starting with something small like industrial park and so on, every country should have sufficient capacity to do that. Thank you. And then, oh, okay. The private sector is certainly is important, but when the program I'm advocating is to facilitate the development of the private sector. So I did not ignore that. But we know that in a structural transformation, without a government facilitation to you know, reduce the transaction cost by you know, improving the infrastructure institution, the private sectors cannot be competitive domestically and internationally. So I think that, that it's not either the state or the private sectors. We need to have a partnership between the state and the private sectors. And uh, certainly, if you have those kind of partnership, we need to avoid rent seeking. And again, to follow in the competitive advantage would be crucial. Because in the sector which you have comparative advantages, what the government do is to help reduce the transaction cost instead of trying to give rent to protect them. And, uh, and so that can also you know, reduce the possibility of rent seekings. And here, certainly, you need to compensate for the first movers. But in the framework I'm arguing is tax incentive for a few years. First, it's very small, and it's time limited. So you can you know, avoid the rent seeking that you give a lot of protection and subsidy. You know, I have many others to respond, but I don't time is limited. Yeah, please, Celeste. Well, um, I'm in the same situation, so uh, I'll just take a minute to say, uh, perhaps on the question on, should Africa have an economic theory? I think it's, a, it's an important question, but it's also really purely an intellectual exercise, because even assuming that Africa could have a new African economic theory, what would be the purpose? We live in a war, okay? we live in a world. Uh, growth in Africa will come from trade. Okay? Uh, by definition, uh, low-income countries don't have domestic demand. So growth will, ha uh, growth will have to come from trade. So whatever economic theory we could come up with, if it doesn't allow us to maximize the opportunities of trade, we won't get there. And that's nothing new. Everybody has done that. Now, there's been the question whether the recent trend in global trade still give or leaves room for countries in Africa. Uh, if African countries can do today what the Asian countries did in the 80s. Uh, I think it's, um, it's a wrong question because global trade and global markets have expanded so much that even a decline of 5-10% uh, still doesn't change the basic dynamics. So, we can have an economic theory for Africa, but to me, it is not really useful. Deng Xiaoping didn't look for an economic, uh, uh, economic theory for China. Uh, and even today, people tend to dismiss some of the ideas which are put in the table here and say, oh, these are Chinese stuff. Well, there's really nothing Chinese about it. Because 
Uh, Deng Xiaoping, when he became the boss, he was 74 years old in 1978. He was coming from jail. The country was big, no infrastructure, um, really even no human capital, even though people think that human capital was very high. But Mao Zedong had, had closed down universities and colleges for 10 years. So I don't believe that uh, human capital was very high. They certainly have no mining, no gold, no gas, uh, no infrastructure. And one, one billion angry people. And he needed to deliver. And the country had a poor reputation as a communist man. He simply needed to do something pragmatic. He went to see Lee, Lee, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who told him what um, he, has, he had learned. But Lee Kuan Yew didn't invent anything. If you look at uh, what has happened in the world in the past 200 years, uh, the Italians did the same thing uh, with industrial district. In fact, the industrial parks that we're talking about today, they are not very different from what uh, Adam Smith described in Scotland uh, 200 years ago. So there's nothing Chinese about it. We just need something that works in the context of today's world. Now, somebody said, well, China is a communist place. Well, we have had many communist, uh, <laughs> we have had many communist government in, uh, in, in Africa. They didn't deliver anything. We've had some brutal dictatorships. So the fact that you are a communist or a non-democratic regime doesn't qualify you to, de to deliver on economics. Uh, Absolutely uh, wonderful. So, uh, right. let's just be pragmatic, and um, I would be more than happy to continue this chat and uh, discussion. Um, I have a Twitter account, so if you Google me and you have, uh, find me on Twitter, we can debate and fight these matters as long as you want. Thank you. Pragmatism, pragmatism, pragmatism. I know that there's an excess. I know, I know there's, there's an excess demand, excess demand for engagement, but guess what? It's a huge shot of price of time because we have to eat. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, discussants. And there will be additional time for additional engagement elsewhere. Bye-bye.